Chinese Bilingual Association. Um, they were the crucial people who um, developed and grew the Chinese Bilingual Program in Edmonton. So, please, could you introduce yourself? Thank you, I. I'm Peter, and obviously this is John from Edmonton. Um, we also like to introduce the rest of our delegation from Edmonton. We have Melanie, who is a alumni student from the association, or not the association, from the program. She went through the program and graduated in 2010, correct? And Don, you all met already before. She's here as, student, as a student at uh, UBC or St. John's College. We have Daniel Free, who is a U of A professor in East Asian Studies. And we have Mr. Wei Li, who wears multiple hats. He's a parent of a student that went through the program, or students or students? <coughs> student. And uh, he was a teacher in the program for numerous years. I won't say how, how many, because that'll show his age. Uh, and he's also a director now at the Confucius Institute in Edmonton. So uh, that's our delegation from Edmonton. Oh yeah, John, John E. Okay. As you can see, it's, can you hear me all right? All right, excellent. As you can see, uh, John and I are volunteer parents. And we, we really have no formal training in language learning or teaching. We're just simply parents. We're parents that have children in the program, or had children in the program. Uh, like Henry was alluding to, that rebellious teen back in the 60s, I was that. I did not learn any second language. No Cantonese, no Toisan, no Mandarin. So I have no comprehension of Mandarin, yet I put my kids through Mandarin. I don't know, John, you probably had the same experience pretty well. So John and myself are pretty typical of members of our board. We have no Mandarin background. But currently we do have, or we are slowly bringing in Mandarin speakers into our board. So we are here to share to you, with you our experiences on the program and our association over these past years. I'll, uh, we'll go through the uh, association history along with a brief history or brief review of the school sites that we have. Please. Our presentation is broken out into two components. We'll deal with the association first and then the program. Like the proverbial question of which came first, the chicken or the egg? And that's safe to say the association came first. So I guess that makes us the chicken? Or the egg, I'm not sure. Anyways, we're, we're one of those. Please, okay. next. Sorry, on my remote control it's not working, so I is my remote control at this point. So the ECBA is run by parent volunteers that are elected to the board every April. One year terms are served by the directors on the board, but these years we encourage at least two years for them to run. John had taught me in staying for five years at least at the helm of this association. The board from year to year has a good representation from schools across the city. As volunteers, we do not receive any financial compensation at all for the work that we do. The only payoff we receive is the knowledge that we are partners with our children in their Mandarin education in Edmonton. Board members have a diverse set skill sets that they bring to the board. John. This, this year, our, our board consists of President Doreen Boone Phillips. Um, I met Doreen before she even put her kids into the program. In fact, I drove with her husband and found out that he was Caucasian and married to a Chinese. And um, I started soliciting them to uh, join the program, put the kid in the program, and now she's a, she's the president, so she's a lawyer and a judge, so she brings her legal expertise to the association, and and that's very helpful. And our director is Angie Liu. She works for the Bank of Montreal. She wears multiple hats. She's on the um, Chinese Lions Club. Uh, and a few other associations, but 
through her employer, her employer donated thousands and thousands of dollars for our events, scholarship, etc., etc. You know, and Stephen Sang is our vice president. He brings enthusiasm and graphic skills, so he, he he's called on to design our T-shirts, our our, our um, banners, our our uh, postcards, etc. So he does countless hours of, you know, I, I think he actually spends more time working for ECBA for no pay than he does working for the government. And, yeah, and our, our, our accountant, or I should say our accountant, our treasurer is Fiona Chung, and of course she's an accountant, so she keeps us in the black. You know, we start spending too much money, she's on our case, she wants our, all our receipts, but we don't give her a receipt, we don't get our money back, you know. And our secretary, Yu Chan, she, she actually works for the Alberta Teachers Association, you know, so she brings insight there and she's always up in the uh, forefront for any of our community projects, you know, uh, chairing, etc., moving things, you know. So, and then there's many more committee heads. So we, we delegate work because we can't do everything ourselves. So uh, uh, you have to use the skills that, that are the members. You know, they have skills. That's right. And John forget, forgot to mention that he's our insurance advisor because he sells insurance too. So he, he covers us in case of any insurable loss. So uh, thank you, Patsy, for the remote control. Let's see how it works. Oh, wrong button. That one. Hey, perfect. Excellent, thank you. So, who are the members of the ECBA? Well, we are a nonprofit association that is a registered charity. We are registered under the Alberta Societies Act. We have obtained a Canada Revenue number as a charity. We always tell parents new to the program, when you enroll your child in the program, you become an automatic member of our association. We collect no monthly fees, nor annual fees, but uh, like the Muses Association, we welcome donations. Where is the ECBA? Well, we really have no bricks and mortar office. Just a presence on the World Wide Web and a postal box. We rely on our board of directors' generous uh, donation of their computer use and printers for any incidental printing and emails. The ECBA is represented at each school by what we call the Associated School Directors. We're hoping, you know, it's, it's hard for a nonprofit organization to keep good people going through. So by having Associated Directors, we're hoping to groom them to take over the executive board we can't all stay forever. Even though John and myself are still here, are still here <laughs> we no longer have children in the program ourselves. Uh, because of the program, our kids are now advanced onto university and they are doing fairly well there. So why this ECBA? Well, the need for the association has evolved over the years from when the association started the bilingual program to where it is now. When the program first started, we had to define the curriculum. We had to seek parental volunteers to help get this program running. And we also had to fundraise to start the program and to cover operating costs, obviously, for that first year. Uh, the role the association has changed the in the present days, um, uh, we still fundraise to support the program through yearly donations to the schools to buy resource material, um, costumes for Chinese dance, dragons, lions, etc. You know, to keep the culture component, not just to learn to read and write Chinese. I think the culture component um, enhances the the program to to learn to read and write. Um, and we, we promote the program alongside with the school district, um, <coughs> always seeking more parents to join in, you know, so uh, 
Peter and I always arm twist. But John being the bigger guy, he has more muscle to twist <laughs> people's arms. So I guess the activities that we do have is obviously like most nonprofit groups, we have monthly meetings. Being that uh, we don't have an office or uh, you know, a building that we meet in, we do meet over the 10-month, uh, uh, I guess, term of a school school term at the individual schools on a monthly basis. It's a great opportunity for our members to visit other schools, school sites to see how they operate and uh, share with other parents within the program. As Peter mentioned, meeting at, at different sites provides uh, insight to parents from from say North Edmonton into how the school is run in South Edmonton for instance. Uh, it informs the parents and, and administrators and teachers uh, what each school is doing. There might be ideas that they gain at that meeting that they can use in the schools they're, they're from. Um, one good example is one school may call the Chinese New Year celebration the chopstick lunch, where another school may call it um, fortune lunch, for instance. But they still have their own identity you know, but yet they share share a lot. It was at these meetings that uh, our association heard of inconsistencies in the curriculum during these uh, first earlier years. So it was at that point the association acted and reviewed that situation with the Edmonton Public School District. And I'm happy to say now, currently, we have a consistent curriculum throughout the district. So these are some of the photos that uh, show some of the activities that occur at our, our meetings. We have um, some presentations by the school district and the Confucius Institute. We have student presentations at our whole schools or from our whole schools, um, you know, such as lion dances. And obviously, we also deal with association business, so, you know, such events as looking for volunteers or bouncing fundraising initiatives off the principals that are. In attendance. Another activity that we have is obviously public awareness, and that is to promote public awareness of our program and our association. We do that by appearing on television, doing radio interviews, newspaper, promotional DVDs. Uh, we conduct events at very public places such as city hall, shopping malls, museums, and even in Chinese New Year celebrations in the community. So these 10, I mean, at 10 years ago, I mean, when I took over the reins of the association, parents had no idea that the ECBA started this program or any association with this program. So they took it for granted because it was always a, what they thought, always a public school program. Even one of the founders of our association I had met back then questioned if we still had this program in Edmonton. <laughs> And I think that founder lives in Vancouver, so that, that founder lost track of us, I guess, and, uh, and, and, and basically uh, asked Peter that question, he, that the association still exists and the program existed. But we are, or the association is always in the public eye. Um, one incident is that we were asked to do a radio interview on the program, and, and a parent uh, right now that enrolled their kids had joined the program, they're Caucasian, yeah. and they thought, they thought, why not, you know? And and now I think she's got three kids, and and she's going to be with the association for the next twenty five years, hopefully. I'm trying to twist her arm to <laughs> step up to the board now. That's right. Um, like John was saying, this parent was looking for a second language uh, course for their children. <coughs> because they came back from Korea, and uh, a little background on the parents, uh, they're not of any Asian background. Um, I believe they're English or British, of sorts. Uh, <laughs> so, but they, they were looking for a second language, and they heard about our program on the radio, and they did a little bit more research into it, and enrolled their children into the program. So, right now, their oldest is in grade four, and a funny situation was when he came home during Chinese New Year's one year, actually it was this past year, 
and asks uh, the parents, why aren't we decorating for Chinese New Year's? And the mother looked at the son, we're not Chinese, we're British. <laughs> but being that the program taught them the traditions and the language, he thought he was Chinese. And the parents realized that, and they started decorating a little bit more into their home. So that's what the, uh, one of the benefits of our program is it brings back the traditions into uh, a family, and obviously into this non-Chinese family, it brought in this tradition, so which is great. So on the slide, we also have, I mean, we have photos of um, events we conduct at West Edmonton Mall. Everybody knows that place, right? I mean, sure, when you visit Edmonton, that's where you go. Um, you know, we did a mid-autumn festival there. We have appearances of our students on TV, and that showcased our talents with a collateral benefit of uh, highlighting or bringing awareness to our program. We also make appearances at farmer's markets. So. We've also, these past few years, been conducting our own Chinese New Year celebrations in uh, the mall in downtown Edmonton. We have a God of Fortune parade that goes throughout the mall. Even our God of Fortune is not even Chinese. So this shows you that diversity is working in our association too. We have games for the kids to play, which uh, gives our student volunteers, uh, you know, an opportunity to engage with the public and learn new skill sets, you know, such as being a carnival gaming type of person, I guess. <laughs> so, but, uh, you know, we also bring out crafts and obviously performances from our 12 uh, schools to showcase our talents that our students have obtained over these years. Other activities, um, we participate in the community and with our different community groups. It's just a list of <coughs> some of the groups in Edmonton that we participate in. Uh, we do that in order to promote our program within the community. And John, I believe, started that pretty well about 10 years ago? 15? Yeah, one, one of the first joint ventures we did was when I was president and um, and uh, we work with the Edmonton Chinese Garden Society. In Edmonton, we are building a Chinese garden. It's still not done. Uh, um, we've already spent a million bucks on it, and we need another million to, to, to complete it. But, but they had a groundbreaking ceremony, and I solicited uh, what we call the Triple C Club from McNally High School. They're, they're Chinese, what they call Chinese Cultural Club. So I enlisted the members from, uh, from the McNally High School to volunteer to perform for the grand opening, uh, for the sod turning, um, to work in the, um, in the uh, dinner, the fundraising dinner, you know, uh, um, silent auction, you know, pushing the silent auction items, uh, um, uh, decorating, etc., etc. And since then, we've always involved the high schools and the junior high students to help the community. I do believe that learning does not just involve learning to read and write. It's also learning to be commu uh, community citizens, to put back into the community. And, and what better way to advertise the program than have our students out there in the forefront helping other, soci other societies and, and the public basically or the other side say, who are these kids? You know, where are they from? And and I think that's our best asset for promotion. Yeah, like like any big city we have a summer fair and a summer parade. So one year actually on our twenty fifth anniversary we created a float along with another community group and we did win the best in the parade for the entertainment. So Again, that's getting the message out to the general public about the program and our association. So we also do fundraising, again, not just for ourselves, but in 2008 when the Sichuan earthquake hit, um, it was suggested by some of our grade 12 students that we should do something to, uh, for our friends and relatives across in China. So the ECBA made a concerted effort to gather all the donations from our 12 schools and submitted to the uh, Canadian Red Cross for the earthquake relief in Sichuan. And I believe we raised about $98,000 at that point. 
To back up this awareness to the community and the city, we have produced publications such as our newsletter, um, our 25th anniversary C-book. I believe we have a copy here somewhere. A few copies? We have one back here. In the back there. So if you're interested, there's copies back there still, Rachel? We have a few. A few copies. Yeah. yeah. He couldn't fit enough in his uh, luggage. And I forgot to mention that news blatantly so from your talk to the world. Yes. That's where our seat would be. We didn't think you noticed, but I was a little embarrassed and I just want to give you at least credit. For <laughs> It's, it's not plagiarism. No, no, it's not. <laughs> we didn't plan it yet. Exactly. It but, used yeah. to be speak to the world, but we changed it to speak with the world. Excellent. No, that's great. <laughs> it's all a common cause, so I mean, we don't, uh, you know, we're not uh, too concerned with that. So again, uh, you know, we do publish uh, the book, brochures, and one fundraising initiative we've done was create uh, calendars. And uh, this one that's up there is our artwork, I guess, created by our students. And we had a you know, contest, selected the winners, and we posted the 12 winners onto that calendar. So we would print them, or design them, print them, and then give them over to the schools for their fundraising purposes. So it was, uh, I mean, they raise you know, money for that, and that's a way of just giving back to the school too. And also, I mean, obviously we're caught up in modern times, so we also have an electronic newsletter that's on our website. Our current cam campaigns for advertising is to advertise on buses. We consider these movable billboards that move throughout the city to advertise our uh, association and our program. We've also are looking at electronic billboards throughout the city. And these are our commuter routes that are close to some of our program schools. And recently, we've been creating postcards. I believe we have copies of that postcard in the back there too, which we mail out to neighborhoods that are near schools to enhance enrollment in their program. So these are all geared around the month prior to kindergarten registration or even during registration. And fortunately, Chinese New Year's falls close to that time, so our efforts are increased at that time to make awareness to the public and to parents about our program. As I was saying, we fundraise for others and we also fundraise for ourselves for the scholarships and awards that we give to the students of our program. We rely on the generous donations from corporate and private donors, which you see listed here. In, oh, sorry. in 2005, our, our scholarship chair, Wei Wong, uh, decided to create uh, what we call the uh, Centennial Scholarship Endowment Fund. Uh, it celebrates Alberta's uh, centennial, basically, and we noticed that the scholarship is going up and down, basically, because, you know, sponsors drop, come in, drop out, etc. So we wanted to stabilize our our scholarship, so we, uh, we decided to start the scholarship fund, and, and that's an endowment fund which we will not touch the principal, we will just use the interest to, to award to the students. Uh, to make it work, uh, we estimated we needed $50,000 to really make it work. And like I said, we started in 2005, the fund is up to over 31000 now. Uh, we, we get donations through Husky Oil, for instance, uh, by distributing car, uh, you know, um, cards that uh, the people buying gas can uh, get, we get 2% of their purchase back, and that goes into that fund. It's not much, you know, $70, $80 every three months or something like that, but it, it keeps coming in, you know. Uh, in fact, just uh, yesterday, I solicited a $200 donation from here in Vancouver to, to, the, uh, to the fund. I won't mention who it is. I, and, um, but really, to kick it off, it was tough to start it. Uh, like our Wei Wong, our scholarship committee, threw in 100 bucks, cha challenged all the past executives, present executives to match the money. And after six months or so, the fund wasn't really going anywhere. 
So I took the opportunity at one of our high school graduations, McNally, to announce I would donate $2,000 and challenge the parents from the graduation uh, ceremonies to, if they were to contribute up to $2,000, I'll double that amount. But I have to say this, Chinese are cheap, so I knew they wouldn't do it. So I, I kept building that fund up for three or four graduations until finally they did do it, and I had to throw, throw another $2,000 in. So we did build it up to 30, over 30000 now. So you have to be creative, but it might cost you money. <laughs> yeah, I'm one of those cheap Chinese people. So. No, what I did was encourage my directors on the board at that time, or actually discourage them and say, well, you volunteer your time. I mean, that's enough uh, you know, donation to the, uh, to the board and to the scholarships. Uh, most recently, we conduct our award ceremonies at uh, Edmonton City Hall. Uh, it's a very public place, and the price is right, it's free. So it's a very ceremonial atmosphere for the students and their families. And, um, you know, we have entertainment and even a police escort at times at this event. Last year we, we made a second record. We actually awarded to over $22,000 to our, our kids in the program from grade 6 to grade 12. Um, I was still getting donations a week a week prior to the award ceremony. So we just kept uh, picking more students. Uh, I think we awarded over 100 students uh, some sort of monetary award. Um, but our record was in, in our 25th anniversary and, we, and sponsors were more willing to donate and we awarded over $30,000 on our 25th anniversary. So the association has been going for 31 years now. So that was five to six years ago that we awarded 30 grand. I mean, up on the uh, slide here, we have, those are just some of the students that have received the uh, awards or what we have called scholarships in the past. I mean, it's a token amount. I mean, it's more an affirmation and a, I guess a confirmation to the students that your achievements in this program are being looked at and you should be rewarded. So uh, we look at it as a way of retaining the students too uh, within the program. I mean, as I stated earlier, some of the activities we do, uh, we also fundraise uh, for events or at events such as casinos. I'm sure you have the same situation here. In BC, we conduct book fairs, vegetable sales, and recently our 30th anniversary uh, banquet. On our 25th anniversary, we published that uh, Green Sea book, Talk to the World, and that gave us uh, numerous opportunities to host events and to do some fundraising. So we offer these uh, all the or a good percentage of our uh, money raised to our schools on a yearly basis to enhance the resources and all, obviously the cultural aspects of the school sites. And some of the fundraising, like we were saying, goes towards the uh, scholarship. Apart from the casino funding, we do special fundraising such as silent auctions. I'm sure most of you know that or have done uh, similar events like that. We've done a live art auction where we have an artist come in during the event he would paint a painting and then we would have you know, a dignitary such as what we have here, the mayor auctioning off that uh, piece of art to the audience. And we have some unusual um, fundraising initiatives. Instead of selling chocolate almonds, we had an organic farmer donate uh, produce to us, such as gaiman, and, uh, pumpkins and carrots, which we sold to the parents. So like John was saying, we have to be creative in order to uh, stand out. I guess due to our fundraising efforts during the Sichuan earthquake in 2008, the City of Edmonton selected our association to help with 40 orphans from Sichuan. We played host to 18 the first year uh, for 10 days, which we call the Open Happiness Tour. 
we buddied up our students together with orphans over that 10 days of their stay. We visit zoos, museums, art galleries, and West Edmonton Mall. We had local hotels billet our orphans at the uh, hotel. The, the orphan project, it was a two-year project, like, like um, Peter said, we, we brought in 18 orphans in the first year. Technically, we were supposed to bring in another 18 in the second year, but corporate donations didn't come through, and, and um, you know, we had some leftover money from the first year, but, but the city sort of threw the ball in our lap completely in the second year, and, um, and and because of the expo in, in, uh, in China, our airfare or expense doubled, basically. And, and I think we calculated the budget to bring, bring the number of orphans over would be about $50,000 in the second year. And, um, you know, it was our um, fundraising that we had to raise the money to bring them over for airfare. We had to feed the orphans plus the buddies. So, because of my network of insurance, my clients, I insure a lot of restaurants. So I got all my clients to donate all the lunches and dinners for that project for the two years. So it's, they can't say no, you know, they say orphan say. Yeah, so it's like, as John has illustrated, it's a matter of networking. I mean, these orphans, they came with little, but you know, hopefully they left with lots of love and compassion for them ourselves and our students. It was a you know fairly tough farewell as you can see by some of the slides there of the orphans crying. But the kids do stay in touch still and you know with the kids across the ocean. So you know due to this uh, electronic age of Facebook, Twitter and emails, so they do stay together. So as you can see Mandarin language is building bridges and friendships across the ocean. Also, we have done fundraising for the uh, Japanese earthquake that occurred in 2011. Um, the ECBA raised funds to donate to the Canadian Red Cross in support of this disaster relief. Also, during that year in Alberta, Slave Lake had a wildfire that devastated that town. And we also raised uh, funds for that too. Our greatest asset of our association is obviously our volunteers. We have students from junior high that participate in our events, senior high. We have alumni coming back to help, such as Melanie here too, and Dawn. And obviously we have parents of the students and alumni parents that come out to help the board members. As in with most nonprofits and volunteer organizations, we can never say enough thank yous to our volunteers. So what we do is we run appreciation ads into the paper. We have volunteer appreciation dinners. We give them access to free tickets to events within the community. We hope that volunteering has benefited the students and the parents by learning new skills, expanding their connections, and building self-confidence and self-esteem. So we like to treat them well so that they come back year after year. And I think that's why John and I keep coming back after year after year. So that's to keep this association running. So now we'll go into the egg portion, or the chicken portion of the program. John. Okay, I is giving me hand signals that I'm going to have to rush this through. And, and uh, so I'm going to go very, very quickly. The, the program basically. Okay. Uh, the Edmonton Public School Board has 12 al alternative languages taught in the public schools. So not only Chinese is taught. You know, we, we uh, public school board teaches uh, languages like uh, uh, Ukrainian, Spanish, German, Punjabi, Hebrew, Arabic, Cree and American Sign Language. Our program was established 30, 31 years ago in two schools, one in the north side of Edmonton and one in the south side. We have the North Saskatchewan River that goes sort of through the middle of the city. So, so we have one school on each side of the river. And the Edmonton, Pub, uh, the Edmonton Chinese Bilingual Educ Education Association was initially known as the Edmonton Chinese Kindergarten Association, which started 
the kindergarten program as a pilot project. And the uh, kindergarten association basically had to rent the space from the public schools, furnish it, uh, pay for transportation to bring the kids to the program. Um, the association technically ran into a deficit. I think there was a ten thousand dollar deficit in the first year, um, and the parents paid that off in the second and third year, for instance. Um, the provincial government and Edmonton Public School Board was very supportive of language learning, and the three key items that sec to secure the program um, into the public school board was the that the Mandarin Chinese bilingual program um, is open to all Canadian students, and I emphasize all Canadian students, whether you're native Mandarin speaker, non-speaker, uh, you're um, African. In fact, I know we have some students taking Chinese that are African descent. Um, so it was. Uh, where am I? It's open to all Canadians. Included in the proposal to the trustees 30 years ago and still holds true today. So in other words, there was a mandate that it has to be open to all students. This is a clause that helped get the approval from the trustees from the Board of Education um, because there would be no exclusion of students based on ethnic background or where they came from inclusive rather than exclusive. Another key part to the proposal, or the second part, there is going to be a native Mandarin speaker teaching the Mandarin portion in the program, and an English teacher teaching the English portion, the half day. Uh, so in other words, there won't be just one teacher, there will be two teachers per grade. Uh, this was a desire by the parents and by, by the Edmonton Public School Board and was mandated. Yeah. Third component, Edmonton, ECBA would be the official liaison between Edmonton Public School Board and the parents. So the association was the liaison group. Um, a program planner, and his name is yeah. Dale McLaren, from Edmonton Public School Board was the unsung hero in 1982 that and that proposed proposed the that um, items one and three, which is is the uh, Mandarin, Mandarin has to be open and that that you have to have two teachers basically, and Alfred Wu, which lived, who lives in Alberta now, is was the legal counsel at that time. And he, he wrote the original draft for the application to the Edmonton Public School Board. Okay, next. Overall, the bilingual model was um, an immersion. It, it was a bilingual, not, not really an immersion program. Program started in kindergarten com and completes in grade 12. Uh, so a 13 year stream. Um, right now, because of what we did with the U of A, um, we, we really it's a 1 to 16 year because now there's a continuation into post-secondary for our, our students. And, and they are accredited. If they write the IB exam six, and get a 6 and 7, they are accredited with a university uh, credit. Uh, because of the bilingual program, it spawned what we call the 3, 6 and 9 year program which is technically a Guinness program starting in grade four, grade seven, and grade nine. Student background, as mentioned, you know, the, the, the program is open to all students. You know, so we have first and second generation Chinese immigrants, third generation and so on. Earlier generations of Chinese immigrants, uh, children of mixed blood parents, you know, um, Non-Chinese children, children, adopted Chinese children in non-Asian families. Um, student needs, kindergarten, elementary, junior high, senior high, English, monolinguals, learn the Chinese language and culture, 
the first generation immigrant truant ESL support and support in adapting to Canadian school environment and mainstream society, maintain and further their children's studies, the second generation immigrant children ESL support while learning the Chinese language, um, those who have become or those whose language is Cantonese or other Chinese dialects learn both Mandarin and English, so they're technically trilingual like Don or what's four lingual, whatever, like Don too, eh? yeah, quadlingual. And, and um, I, I experienced uh, from talking to administration teacher, teachers that s students from China coming to Canada, English is lacking, but joining the bilingual program, the, the students in, in native in Canada has helped those kids learn English, and in turn, our kids are learning Mandarin faster. You know, so it complements each other to, to integrate. And the next slide, so the distribution is, is basically you can see that, that you know 10% of our population is in kindergarten, 50% approximately is in the elementary schools, 24 to 25% in junior high, with 15% of the pie in the senior high level. Of course, this will vary by a few percentage points. Each year. Each year. <laughs> okay. Kindergarten is basically half day, Monday to Friday. And so the Chinese and English teachers alternate each day to get that 50% mix. Uh, starting Chinese studies at an early age can enable children to be more successful with the four tones in Chinese pronunciations, which is crucial for communication. Uh, in the past, social studies was taught in the program in Chinese, in Mandarin. Uh, but because of the change in the social study curriculum, it was uh, too hard to teach social studies in Chinese. So the switch was made to mathematics. So all our, all our elementary schools, math, math is taught in Chinese now. Uh, and next chart, you can see that this is the provincial achievement test. Um, grade 3 provincial achievement test results. Curve shows our students equal or slightly better in achievement than the district average. And in the first three years, um, the kids may be a little bit behind in development, but after the three years, they, they excel, exceed the, uh, the, the district averages. As you can see in the grade, uh, the, the test for grade 6, that, that our, our, our kids or any kids taking a bilingual program is higher on the average. So it's advantageous to, to put your kids in a second language or a bilingual program. Okay, elementary schools, you can see by the map, right now we, we do have uh, five elementary schools geographically located for the city to be accessible by all areas of the city. Uh, right now we have a demand for a, a Southwest Edmonton to put a program in there, but we have a challenge there. There is no available school sites or space available by Edmonton Public School Board. They have not built enough schools. So we're still lobbying the, the Public School Board to to come up with an alter alternate program to somehow get get another site. And junior highs. Okay, yeah, um, we have four junior high sites. Um, in the ten years prior, the the uh, number of minutes in Chinese taught in junior high was about 120 minutes increased to 150 minutes now, and now we're up at 300 minutes. So the extra 150 minutes is, is to teach uh, optional courses like cooking and some, uh, um, arts, for instance, and that instruction is done in Mandarin. Uh, we have one junior high that actually teaches math in Mandarin, and that 
junior high. In fact, they approached Peter and they were worried about teaching math there that, that would have turned, turned the parents off. Well, it didn't. The parents were clamoring at the door. That enrollment the next year just skyrocketed. And the locations of our junior high is geographically located, so it is accessible to the feeder schools that our elementary school feeds into these junior highs. Um, and you know, so yeah, so we made we made sure that that is available for the feeder schools, senior high schools. Again, the first school was geographically located between our our two junior highs. And, and uh, we have three high schools now, you know, Emmy Lissert and Ross Shep came online at the same time. And uh, what can I say, you know, we, we don't need another high school yet, we need another elementary school. Okay. <laughs> okay, um, teachers. Okay, right now we have um, 47 teachers in the, our 12 schools. Uh, some teachers in the program, I think we have four teachers that went through the program. Uh, started in kindergarten, went through the program, got their education degree, and they're back teaching now. So we've gone through a cycle. Uh, and teachers, of course, must have accreditation before they can teach so you know that's the same thing is in BC okay I'll let you okay. well, well, so we'll all right um, thanks John so in summation I guess our challenges in the earlier years obviously have been to start that pilot program in the uh, city so uh, finding resource material obviously was a challenge space as John uh, uh, alluded to we have to look for a surplus space within the uh, school sites and pay for that rental. <coughs> when we did get the space, it was an empty room, so again, we had to furnish it too, so parents had to pay for the furniture. And obviously, being a new program, it had no curriculum, so that curriculum had to be developed by the teachers in the program. And busing to junior highs, oh sorry, uh, busing to the junior highs was also an issue, so we had to look at uh, funding that and obviously school selections for the junior and senior highs at that time was a concern. John, you want to do this one? Of course, politics always plays a part, you know. In the early years, the program was, was uh, geared around Taiwan's education system uh, using the Xu Yin and, and traditional characters, but over the last 10 years, there had to be a shift to to uh, Pinyin and simplified it. And when that was proposed by Empton Public School Board, of course, we, we said we just can't throw it at the into the program. So we phased it in. We phased it in from starting grade seven, and a few years later we, we phased it in to start grade four. Now we're officially in, in at kindergarten and grade one. Uh, so there are challenges, you know, politically that, that we have to face. Uh, uh, school curriculum consistency was a push by the parents. So, so we noticed that in the elementary schools 15 years ago that the teachers were teaching whatever they thought was good. But the association started to do what they call PD Day. We funded the PD Day so that the teachers could share the, the good and the best part. And, and, and we did that for two years, and then the school board took it over and basically provided PD days to make, make the program more consistent. And I'm going to skip, we're going to rush through. Let's keep writing? Okay, yeah. we'll keep writing. And then obviously the challenges currently are uh, like growing the program, uh, obviously through uh, public awareness. Uh, student retention has always been a concern when the kids go from grade six to grade seven, because in Alberta or in Edmonton, we change schools in grade six, 
then on grade nine, we also changed school to uh, senior high. So that's always been a, a concern. Uh, closed school boundaries, there's some trustees that, or actually the sector of the population that looks at uh, closed boundaries to save their neighborhood schools. So that's always a concern. Um, let's see, program evolution, I guess. Our program has grown from 40 students in two schools to 2,000 students, at least 2,000 <coughs> students in 12 schools. And we're looking at attracting more than just uh, you know Chinese families, but we're looking at non-Chinese families. In order to do that, we moved to the uh, Pinyin phonetics and, and the simplified characters. And we have a firm volunteer base of students that uh, help us out. And we have an affirmation of our language uh, learning through international accreditations of the HSK and the YCT. These are some of the comments that uh, parents have had and uh, you know, students have had after they went through our program. Give me a few seconds there to digest that. And that's some of our uh, photos of our outcome of our program, traditions, and culture. And if you need more information, uh, obviously, you know, 30 years of history, as you can see, John and I like to boast about it. And, you know, it takes a while, but uh, there's more information on the website if you would like to uh, look at that. So, we do hope our presentation today has proven or provided you with a great insight into our association and program. I know it's very hard to single out one item that makes for a successful bilingual program. If we had pinpointed it, bottled it, John and I would be rich. Right? <laughs> but we believe, as Aristotle stated, the whole is greater than the sum of its parts. So we believe that the combination of the association, the parents, program, teachers, school district, and students have contributed to the great success that we are experiencing here in Edmonton. Or in Edmonton, sorry. So thank you very much.